Good afternoon. I'm Dane Stengler, Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thanks for joining us today. This is the first installment in what we're calling our American Innovation Series. It's going to look at several topics about past, present, and future American innovation and American economic competitiveness. Today, we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by Marty Cooper. Marty Cooper is uh, known by many as the father of the cell phone. If you've seen the movie Wall Street, uh, the original Wall Street uh, with Gordon Gecko, that is the phone that Gordon Gecko used was the Dynatac telephone that uh, Marty uh, invented and is the patent holder on from his time at Motorola. Marty is also a serial entrepreneur, uh, having founded a number of companies in the wireless industry. He serves on the FCC's Technological Advisory Council. He's also the author uh, of a book, of a recent book that was published uh, last year called Cutting the Cord, uh, about his, uh, his work and about his outlook on the impact of wireless innovations on uh, human life. Marty, thanks for joining us. Great, well, a great pleasure to be. <clears throat> Marty, there's several topics uh, that I'd like to cover with you today. Um, let's start with your recent book, Cutting the Cord. Can you tell us about your motivations for writing the book? What, what can readers expect to find uh, when they pick this up? Well, you know, Dan, uh, uh, cellular telephony has had a greater impact on society, I think, than any other invention in the history of mankind. Uh, there are uh, most of the people in the world today use cell phones. That, that's an incredible, uh, and the impact uh, has been enormous and yet, very few people know the story about how the cell phone was introduced. Uh, and the most interesting part of that is that cellular telephony almost did not happen as we understand it today. I thought that story was so dramatic and so interesting that uh, people would enjoy it. Uh, and it took me quite a while to put that story down on paper. Uh, by the time I got done, I realized that the story of how the M the cell phone has changed people's lives throughout the world is not well known. We know how people use it in, in the developed countries. We know about texting and email, uh, 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 going on to search engines. Uh, but the fact that uh, in uh, undeveloped countries, how the cell phone is affecting healthcare, uh, how it's improving productivity. So I uh, decided to include that in the book. Uh, which led me on to the fact that we are only at the beginning of the cell phone revolution. There is so much more that cell phone technology is going to do to revolutionize, revolutionize education, healthcare, uh, uh, collaboration. And so I covered that in the book as well. Uh, so my book ended up uh, being a hodgepodge uh, of uh, different things. And uh, uh, at least a few people have found it uh, interesting, Dane. I want to talk about all of those things uh, that you just mentioned, Marty. Uh, I also want to remind our audience uh, that if you have a question uh, for Marty Cooper, please submit it using the live chat function on YouTube or tweet at us using the hashtag BPC Live. So, Marty, you talked, uh, you, 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 your book covers a lot of ground, and you've just given us the, ho the high level summary. Let's dig into that, that story that you talked about, the original motivation for the book, the story of the cell phone. Um, there's a lot I want to get into with you, but can you just give us a, a, a brief recounting uh, of that story to tell our audience uh, about what, what, what it is you cover in the book? Well, I, I should let you know, Dave, that I have very, a lot of trouble being brief, but, but I'll do my best. <laughs> the, uh, the beginning of cell phone, the idea of having, uh, instead of a, a single transmitter uh, in a city covering a very wide area, which is not very efficient in the use of the radio spectrum. Uh, the idea of having a lot of individual uh, 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 stations within a city uh, and, and uh, moving conversations one to another, and that idea was first brought up at Bell Labs in 1947, would you believe? Uh, and uh, a, a couple of fellows named uh, Reed and uh, uh, Ray Young uh, uh, produced a memo, they put it in the file cabinet uh, at uh, uh, Bell Laboratories. Uh, and not until 1969 that somebody in the Bell system decided, well, this uh, might be a useful system. 
Uh, and so they announced that they were going to create something called cellular telephony. Uh, the only problem was that their view of cellular telephony was, and you won't believe this, a car phones. You know, a, a, a society had been constrained uh, in, in uh, the telephone business to be wired up to a wall or a desk for a hundred years. And now the bell system was coming along and telling us we're now going to be constrained to our cars. Didn't make any sense to us because we had already conducted uh, businesses in the two-way radio business. And we realized the importance of the freedom that comes from being able to communicate anywhere at any time with no constraints, whatever. So the, that was our first uh, uh, conflict with the uh, Bell system. And the second was even more important uh, because the Bell system said, well, uh, uh, this is not going to be a very big business. There are not many people going to be interested in cell phones. Uh, so uh, we really need a monopoly. We want to be the only provider. Well, that didn't make a lot of sense to us because uh, in, in their definition of what cell phones are, they wanted to take over our business as well, two-way radios. And Motorola was doing pretty well uh, at, uh, at that business. So this little company in Chicago, uh, uh, little meaning uh, uh, our uh, total sales were a billion dollars. The Bell System was the biggest company in the world by, by every measure. And we took them on and that process uh, took it from 1969 to 1983. And it was never certain that they were not going to win. Just think about it, Dave. And these guys uh, had uh, 200 lobbyists working on the FCC alone, never mind the, the uh, Congress. Uh, we had three people in Washington doing, doing the whole job. So uh, not until uh, the uh, uh, late 1980s or late late 1970s, did it become clear that uh, the uh, Bell system that the FCC was going to insist upon competition? Uh, they were going to let the industry decide whether this was going to be uh, a, uh, uh, a, a car phone or a, a personal phone system. And of course, as we all know, uh, it. Uh, the first phones that came out were, in fact, car phones. Uh, the, uh, the first portable cell phones were very costly. They didn't work all that great. Uh, but within 10 years, you couldn't buy a car phone. So uh, 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 this little company in Chicago finally did it up uh, succeeding. Marty, there's several elements of that story I want to come back to. And it is a terrific story. And I, I definitely encourage um, uh, folks to check out Marty's book. You mentioned the FCC. So you talked about where things were in the 40s up through the 80s. Now let's fast forward to today. You have served for a number of years on the FCC's Technological Advisory Council. Are, are you able to describe for some of us uh, some of the work you've done with them? What, what are some of the issues that the FCC and, the, and this council are struggling with in the wireless industry today? Well, the, the uh, uh, tech the Technology Advisory Council of the FCC uh, advises the FCC. They make recommendations. The, uh, there are roughly 50 members or so. Uh, they are all experts uh, in the, uh, the uh, fields uh, that uh, the FCC is uh, interesting, cellular being only one of them. Uh, and they do make recommendations every year. And they've covered issues uh, like uh, uh, how do we prevent people from uh, uh, reusing stolen phones? Uh, uh, so that's one issue that uh, uh, has been of great importance. Uh, and uh, that problem has been pretty much uh, solved. Uh, but the focus right now is on uh, cellular telephony, 5G, 6G. Uh, and uh, uh, that is where uh, much of the emphasis of the uh, uh, of the attack is the attack advises the FCC on what new technologies are available and what positions uh, they advise the uh, FCC for uh, to take uh, positions on uh, the uh, specific things that I've been uh, uh, promoting uh, are in fact uh, uh, technologies that increase efficiency 
uh, because I believe very strongly uh, that the, the important things that the FCC should be doing about cellular uh, is two things. One is increasing coverage so that everybody has access to uh, the uh, uh, features of uh, cellular safety. Uh, and and uh, collateral with that is that the cost of cellular uh, should be such uh, uh, that once again, uh, nobody should be in a position of not being able to afford it. Can you imagine in the future that uh, it's going to be impossible for somebody to have a complete education without having access to cellular uh, technology, without being able to reach out to the internet, to reach out to all the knowledge in the world, wherever a student is, uh, and be able to do that uh, affordably. So uh, uh, my uh, uh, focus uh, on the uh, Technology Advisory Council has been uh, in that area. Uh, I, uh, of course, support uh, the continued advance of technology. Uh, that is what 5G is. 5G, 6G is going to be more of that. Uh, 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 5G and 6G are not just a single technology. They are a continuum of a whole bunch of features. Uh, but the focus of 5G uh, has been, uh, at least the popular focus, has been on millimeter waves. This is using very high frequencies uh, uh, and uh, the use of, uh, of uh, cellular telepathy for what's called the uh, Internet of Things. Uh, I'm not in total agreement with, with that. Uh, I think that we still have a long way to go with the Internet of People. And so uh, I'm the outlier on the Technology Advisory Council. Everybody is reaching out for these fancy new technologies. Uh, I support that very strongly, uh, but uh, I still believe that the biggest impact of cellular uh, is on human beings. We are gonna revolutionize education. We are re gonna re revolutionize uh, healthcare uh, and improve both of those areas uh, remarkably uh, and the most important thing is uh, the collaboration among people is going to make everything that we do more efficient. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, it may be a big stretch, uh, but uh, wouldn't it be nice to eliminate the whole concept of poverty? Have us be so productive that nobody has to be poor. Marty, there's several other things that you've just talked about that I want to uh, ask about. You, you talked about 5G, you talked about the digital divide, about gaps in access and the internet of people. Before we get to those things, one of the, the key concepts that underlies all of those issues and that you spend a great deal of time in your book talking about is spectrum, because uh, that's what all of this stuff kind of rests on. So talk to our audience about this, this ethereal you know, thing called spectrum and, and why we should care about it and, and how it's used. Well, I, I don't think you want to turn this uh, podcast into a physics course, uh, but uh, I would hope that uh, that any of the listeners have tuned to know what the, uh, what the radio frequency spectrum is. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, nothing more than uh, electromagnetic waves uh, moving through space. Uh, they move at the speed of light. Uh, they uh, have a property of uh, frequency. Uh, and so uh, uh, we now use the spectrum mostly for communications for things like uh, it started out being as simple as just Morse code, which is what Marconi did 120 uh, years ago, uh, to uh, uh, broadcast radio, broadcast television. Uh, now uh, the uh, uh, internet uh, is uh, accessible. Uh, through uh, uh, wireless communications, uh, but we still use wireless for uh, radar, for GPS, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, when Marconi started out, it was only possible uh, to have, would you believe this, uh, in, in an area of thousands of miles, you could only have one provider. And what Marconi did was, was create literally an explosion of elect electromagnetic energy, uh, and that explosion was a dot. 
<laughs> so and, and the, the total of communications was a whole bunch of dots that uh, were, uh, were essentially Morse code. Uh, it didn't take long before we figured out how to have multiple people. So the capacity uh, of the radio uh, uh, spectrum has been increasing remarkable, but uh, remarkably over the past years. Uh, in fact, uh, I did an analysis and discovered that the capacity of the radio spectrum has doubled every uh, three and a half years, two and a half years, every 30 months uh, for over 100 years. If you go through that doubling process, it turns out the capacity has increased uh, by trillions of times. And yet there's still a myth that is propagated uh, that spectrum is like beachfront property that there's only so much of it, when that's used up, uh, there isn't any more. Therefore, we have scarcity. Uh, therefore, uh, some people conclude that spectrum's very expensive, that we ought to make sure that only certain people can have it. Uh, and that is just a terrible, terrible conse consequence because uh, they, all of the evidence, all of the facts say that spectrum is abundant. Every time we want to start a new business, come up with a new uh, uh, something like satellites, we find more spectrum. Now, how is that? It's because technology has been increasing the capacity of the spectrum faster than the demand for more spectrum. Spectrum is not scarce. Spectrum is abundant. And yet our Congress uh, has is still living is still living in the past they still i i really shouldn't take on the, the entire congress uh because people already uh, consider me to be an outlier uh, but it, the reality is that that the uh if you use the most modern technology uh, we there has never been a scarcity of spectrum there is not a scarcity today and we know enough technologies that for at least another 50 years or so, the uh, of, of availability of, of uh, spectrum is going to be greater than the demand. Now, you wonder why, uh, what impact does this idea of scarcity have? Well, it, it turns out that the, uh, when you uh, constrain the uh, new businesses that could start on spectrum uh, by actually charging money for spectrum, you create a scarcity that's uh, artificial, that really doesn't have to be. And that is what the situation is today. We uh, auction off spectrum. We make people to spend uh, huge amounts of money for it. Once they have exclusive use for the spectrum, uh, we don't require those people to actually use the spectrum and so most of the radio frequency spectrum today uh, sits there fellow uh, and is not being used. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, there, there is uh, uh, an artificial uh, scarcity, uh, but the bottom line is you got a good idea for uh, using radio frequency spectrum in the interest of the public. Uh, somehow we always seem to find uh, spectrum that allow people to do that. There are literally uh, thousands of entities, tens of thousands of entities using the spectrum, both uh, public and uh, private. Uh, and in fact, uh, most of the people in the world are now transmitting uh, in the radio frequency spectrum. Thanks, Marty. Um, that's uh, incredibly fascinating. The observation you mentioned about the doubling um, capacity of spectrum is, an observation that you made and is actually uh, codified today as Cooper's Law. Um, we have a couple questions. We have an audience question. We also have a pre-submitted question. I want to make sure we work in here before we return to some of the topics uh, such as 5G. Uh, but I have a question for you that relates to spectrum capacity, relates to spectrum efficiency. This question was submitted by uh, your friend and the current chair of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, Jessica, uh, Jessica Rosenworcel. Chair Rosenworcel would like to get your thoughts on spectrum efficiency. She asks, thanks to the mobile revolution that you helped kick off, we're cramming more and more activity into our airwaves. How do we ensure we're that, that spectrum, we're using spectrum efficiently to accommodate 
all of these new uses. How do we create policies that encourage what you just described, spectrum abundance, rather than scarcity? So Chair Rosenworcel is kind of asking the public policy question uh, that goes right alongside with the technological advances that you just talked about. Well, let me first uh, point out that we are very blessed having uh, Jessica uh, Rosenworcel will be the uh, chairwoman of the SEC. Uh, she is a dynamo. Uh, she's extraordinarily intelligent. Uh, and I would expect her to ask uh, a really uh, important question like that. Uh, the, right now, the FCC does not tell people uh, how to use uh, the radio spectrum. Uh, and one way or another, they should be encouraging, uh, they should be requiring uh, the entities that use the spectrum uh, to, uh, to use it uh, effectively. And the biggest example of that uh, is the way in which the uh, uh, cellular carriers today use the lower frequency bands. Uh, somehow or other, uh, the, there is technology available that will multiply the efficiency, the, the capacity of the radio frequency channels by at least 10 times. And yet the uh, carriers today, uh, we, we ostensibly have competition uh, in the business and yet the carriers uniformly are saying, we need more spectrum. Uh, and uh, the Congress has urged the FCC to make more spectrum available. And so the, the uh, carriers have very little motion, to, uh, really very little motivation to increase the efficiency, the capacity of their existing spectrum. And so they keep moving up to higher and higher frequency bands. Uh, and now they are, uh, when you uh, buy a 5G cell phone, uh, you now have access to frequencies uh, starting uh, in the 900 megahertz band uh, as low as 600. Uh, megahertz and going all the way up into millimeter waves, thousands uh, of uh, gigahertz. Uh, now you, you might ask, well, why is that a bad thing? Well, first of all, uh, it costs a lot of money to do these uh, things. Uh, and perhaps that money could be more uh, uh, better spent on serving uh, the many parts of the country that have no cellular service at all. Uh, the place that I am passionate about, the area I'm passionate about, is uh, education. Uh, would you believe, Dane, that 40%, that, that number is not precise, but it's a big number like that. I think it's even more, some people think it's a little less, uh, of our students in this country do not have access to the internet uh, in their educational process. Uh, that's a travesty. I don't think you can get a good education without having continuous uh, uh, access to the internet. And I'm not talking about just cable. I'm not talking about just uh, having Wi-Fi. Uh, a student should be able to look something up uh, to access the internet at any time that they have a spare time uh, and at any location, just as the rest of us do uh, uh, when we access the internet. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, we are now selling cell phones that have access to all of these frequency bands. And guess what the impact is on society? Uh, most people will never, never get any impact at all uh, out of 5G, out of their cell phones. And just their cell phone is bigger, it's heavier, it costs more, it's less reliable. Uh, uh, you know, I could just keep uh, going on. Uh, 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 we, we somehow have uh, have been deluded into thinking uh, that 5G is really important for the individual. 5G is important in the long term because 5G does introduce some uh, uh, technologies to society uh, that uh, improve uh, efficiency. Uh, at some point in the future, uh, there will be factories run by 5G. Uh, the carriers are talking about having uh, uh, operations done remotely. Uh, I'm very skeptical about that. Uh, if I'm going to have the operated on, I want that surgeon to be right there. And I do not want a lot of unreliable electronics between me and the surgeon. 
but uh, uh, that is, uh, certainly remote healthcare is going to be important in the future. Uh, running factories is going to be important, but we don't yet have uh, the infrastructure for doing that. We haven't yet created that, but the educational problem, the healthcare opportunity is here today. And one way or another, uh, the FCC ought to be encouraging that. And, I, and in my book, I have made some proposals uh, to that effect. I think uh, that with a, a little bit uh, of subsidization that costs the taxpayers absolutely nothing, that we could urge people to provide uh, educational uh, access to the internet in rural areas, that we could allow poor people even in urban areas uh, to have access uh, to the internet where they don't have today. Uh, all the FCC has to do is to make some, uh, what I believe are relatively minor changes to the rules. Of course, uh, somehow I don't have to make those rules. It's, it's uh, Chairwoman Warsaw that's going to have to do it. But I'm sure it's a lot harder uh, than it, uh, it appears to be. Uh, but we should not only be prosecuting uh, uh, 5G, we should not only be doing millimeter waves, we ought to be motivating people to use these lower frequencies. And the worst thing of all, Dane, is when we started cellular, cellular service uh, in the United States was the lowest cost in the world. Would you believe that today it's the highest cost? Mm -hmm. so if you make a list of the country of the cost of cellular service, uh, in developed countries, it's it's higher, and the U.S. higher than anybody, uh, and that is a, a travesty. Technology is supposed to reduce cost and make things more available. Uh, somehow or other, uh, I believe uh, that it's incumbent upon uh, the FCC and the Congress, since the FCC kind of reports to the Congress, uh, to call these uh, the uh, carriers to task uh, and get them to. Uh, prosecute cellular in a way that helps uh, everybody uh, and not just uh, the uh, 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 industry. Uh, the, the part that really, uh, 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 I was going to say makes me passionate, but I, I don't get passionate about negative things. <laughs> but I really get upset when I see a full page advertisement by a uh, cellular carrier that says, 5G is what you wanted. And, and I just wonder uh, just what it is that they think we are going to get, we, the public, are going to get out of 5G in the uh, short term. Uh, and it is certainly not what they are proposing, which is super high speeds and super high latency. Nate, what was the last time you had a latency problem? <laughs> and, and do you really get a benefit of being able to download a movie? in three minutes instead of nine minutes. So uh, let's focus in on the real problems. Let's, let's make sure that everybody gets access to the internet. Let's make sure that, the, uh, that this access is, to, is affordable uh, so that everybody can benefit uh, from uh, whether it's education, healthcare, collaboration, uh, that, that all of us uh, uh, move forward uh, in society. Marty, um, there's way more here that we can that we <laughs> would be able to talk about in a uh, 30 or 40 minute conversation. I want to ask you, um, I want to ask you about 5G. You, you've just talked about it on the technological side, on the policy side. I also want to ask you about it in the context of global competitiveness. But first, we have an audience question from submitted by YT, uh, just the initials YT. And YT asks uh, about you and Arlene uh, Harris, your wife, um, also a highly successful wireless entrepreneur. And YT asks, uh, references um, the Jitterbug phone and its, um, and its impact in connecting older adults, uh, allowing them to connect through technology and helping enfranchise them uh, with technology. And YT's question is, what other efforts are you involved in or what other efforts have you seen or are you seeing these days that are in that same spirit of um, once again enfranchising, um, whether it's older Americans or, or others uh, through technology? 
we can come back to it if you want a minute to think about it, but um, I wanted to make sure we got that question in. Yeah, well, uh, 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 certainly uh, our leader and I have both been passionate about uh, the, the issues that I just talked about, uh, and Arlene uh, is uh, brilliant enough and energetic enough to actually have uh, uh, implemented this thing. Her dream of the uh, jitterbug phone uh, was to, first of all, make the phone simple for those people that do not want to get the, uh, are not either capable or not interested in the complexities of what the modern uh, cell phone is. And I don't know about you, about you, Dane, uh, but my uh, cell phone has uh, numerous features. In fact, most of the features of my cell phone, uh, I not only don't use, but I don't know how to use them, which is really embarrassing for me because people do expect me to, to know about them. Uh, and yet I have to pay for all these things. Uh, and and uh, so the idea of uh, the jitterbug phone was to create a phone that was intuitive of simple uh, and it created a community that, uh, of, of people who could interact with each other uh, and do it in a very simple way. Uh, uh, we ended up, uh, for reasons that, I, uh, that are beyond the scope of this discussion, uh, uh, selling the uh, Jitterbug business, it's the uh, name of the company, was Great Call, uh, to Best Buy. They are prosecuting that uh, business today, but we never completed it. Uh, Arlene is working on a new generation of ways that people could communi communicate with each other, uh, can save all of their pictures, annotate their pictures, uh, exchange uh, or uh, add uh, commentary uh, to these pictures. So uh, to have a, a new generation generation of ways that all people, including uh, family seniors, can uh, uh, communicate, uh, communicate with each other, create legacies. Uh, uh, all these things can be done today, but with complexities that are way beyond what most people could do. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, Arlene is, is uh, strongly engaged in that today. So uh, really what we uh, are trying to do is to find out those people who are getting left behind by the technology uh, and to try to uh, make sure uh, that we don't leave people behind, that we make technologies available to everybody uh, because people are entitled, uh, everybody's entitled to get the benefits of those technologies. Now, I ought to point out, uh, since we're, we got to this term technology, let me tell you what my definition of technology is. Technology is the application of science to create products and services that make people's lives better. If you don't have that people part of it, then it's not technology, it's curiosity, uh, it's science, uh, but technology really does involve make people's lives better. Everybody ought to get the benefits of technology. Marty, um, thank you, that was a terrific answer. Um, I have a couple of concluding questions that um, for you. We just have a few minutes left. I want to bring our discussion to a close back to your story and back to a more personal level. But I have one more question I want to ask you about some of the things you've been talking about, and that's about 5G. You've talked about the technology. You've talked about uh, spectrum. Uh, you've talked about the public policy aspect of this. I've also heard you talk about 5G um, when it comes to the U.S. competitiveness and other um, countries. So uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center is, is embarking on a, on a new project around U.S. economic competitiveness. How should we be thinking about 5G when it comes to this debate that the country is having about how the U.S. stays competitive with, with China and with the EU and with India and with other countries? How does 5G fit into that conversation? How should we be thinking about it? Well, uh... Let me tell you, as you say, we have a limited amount of time here. We could, we could have a whole session uh, just on that subject alone. <clears throat> the important thing about 5G is to understand that the, it's the uh, end result that's important. 
what what are you going what what cost are you going to reduce what capability are you going to provide that you did not have before uh, the the uh, two biggest features of 5g actually there are three features uh, that are uh, especially important for the future and one is super high speeds and the second is uh, uh, low latency and, uh, and the third is a, th a concept called slicing and, and let me just tell you what they are very briefly uh, super speed i think you understand uh, we don't need the super speed for watching movies and and uh in our uh, normal interaction on the uh, internet uh, but if you are uh, uh running a machine uh, where you want to know pre precisely where that machine is at every given instant uh, it turns out uh, and have that machine react quickly super high seeds are important uh, latency is important latency has to do with uh, when you uh, uh, want something to happen at a distance uh, that uh, that you get an immediate reaction well we are stuck with the idea of the uh, radio waves moving at the speed of light uh, and therefore you have to have uh, computing available right at a cell site very close to where the uh, cellular technology is actually applied. Uh, that uh, is, is only needed in certain uh, places. Uh, uh, it's needed if you have a factory that's going to be run uh, through a cellular uh, system. Uh, at the moment, there aren't any factories like that. Uh, I'm not suggesting that 5G is not important. I would love to see the carriers uh, producing 5G uh, as it's being used without handicapping the what I referred to before as the Internet of People. I think we did a better balance between 5G uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Internet of People. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, 5G uh, is an important competitive thing, but I want everybody to understand that what cellular does is improve productivity. It makes us uh, make every dollar of effort produce more good for more people. And that's what the uh, important is not super high speeds, not super latency, and not all these technological features. Somehow we have to get the engineers to go back to the basics and understand what we are trying to do is make people's lives better. And somehow or other, and I especially observe that uh, in the Technology Advisory Council, I, we got the smartest people in the world, uh, but every once in a while they get so caught up in the, uh, uh, the science of things, they forget about the people part. Uh, we cannot forget about that. And that's my only issue. Do I believe in 5G? Absolutely. Uh, do I, think 6G is important? Well, let me know if you're going to solve the education uh, problem. Let me know if you're going to solve the digital divide. Let me know if you're going to solve uh, the issue of poverty. How can we have poverty uh, with so much abundance today? If you tell me that 6G is going to solve those problems, I am the 6G champion. Marty, there's two more questions I, I want to ask you. Uh, one, I want to bring this back to the story uh, of the cell phone uh, and of your invention. Um, you know, part of that debate that the U.S. is having, U.S. Congress, U.S. people, part of that debate that we're having today about innovation and competitiveness is there are a lot of people are concerned about kind of the future of American invention and the future of American innovation, our capacity to invent and innovate. You have spent decades uh, innovating and inventing uh, and starting companies around those inventions and innovations. And I know you continue to work with young people today, uh, inspiring them to invent and to innovate. Um, what are some insights you might uh, pass along to our audience and those who will watch this video later about the, the process of invention, about the nature of innovation? If we want more people inventing and, in, and innovating, what's the best way uh, to support them? Well, uh, that's a really hard question, <laughs> but I can tell you some of the things that have impacted me. And one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me was uh, when I joined uh, Motorola back in uh, 1954. So it's, a, it's incredible when I think about how long ago that was. Now everybody's going to know how old I am, Dave. 
but uh, what, one of the uh, basic philosophies of Motorola, which they really practiced, uh, was a statement that the founder of Motorola, Paul Galvin, uh, made, which was, uh, do not fear failure, reach out. And somehow or other uh, in our society, we have to learn how to encourage people to take chances, to try out new things, to uh, allow them to fail uh, and recover and do it again. Uh, and I have had my share of failures in life. Fortunately, at Motorola, uh, they somehow let me do those. So that, uh, and so that uh, uh, I had the ability to actually have some uh, successes to counter that. So the the uh, concept of of, uh, of uh, uh, accepting the uh, risks of starting new things is something that we have to cultivate in our society. Uh, and somehow I think we have lost that to a large degree. Uh, our venture capitalists, I think, uh, to some extent, uh, have forgotten about the idea of venture. You know, venture does mean take risks. Uh, I think most venture capitalists uh, only invest in things that they think are sure things. And uh, uh, if there's anything that the, where the government and the uh, industrial society should do is be taking more risks uh, and understanding that the probability of success uh, uh, should not be, should specifically not be 100%, that they ought to be taking a lot of 20% of chances uh, with the understanding uh, that some of those high risk things are going to produce a, a very high returns. So uh, uh, I'm sure that we could explore this uh, uh, a lot more, but that's the best I could do at this moment. Uh, Thanks, Marty. So final question for you, and you've been incredibly generous with your time. I want to thank you very much. Um, I want to end on a very personal note um, for you, but one that has deep resonance uh, today. So you open um, the book, I think it, um, or early on in the book, you talk about your parents uh, fleeing Ukraine um, uh, about a century ago amid uh, violence. Um, I wonder if you could talk to our audience about you know, how that personal perspective shapes how you're um, responding to the crisis in Ukraine today. You lived through a world war, you served in um, the US Navy. I just wonder how those experiences and your personal, uh, your family history um, is shaping your uh, response and perspective to that crisis today? Well, Dave, you know, I, I've always known since uh, my earliest days, even when I was uh, 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 in kindergarten, uh, I've always known that I was going to be a technologist in one course, and I've always been curious. Uh, and, and one thing about being an engineer is you try to be logical. Uh, the idea of warfare of people killing other people for uh, ideological reasons is so reprehensible to me. I just uh, I have just so much trouble accommodating that. Somehow we have to figure out how to uh, eliminate uh, uh, war. Uh, the only good part that came out of that uh, is because uh, my folks were, were uh, uh, persecuted in the Ukraine. And by the way, it was not the Ukrainians that did that. It was the Tsar and it was Cossacks who were basically outlaws who made life miserable for these uh, people uh, in the Ukraine. In fact, by the way, that was not uh, the Ukraine at that time. Uh, they, they were in the area near Kiev, just where the fighting is going on today. Uh, but that was Russia a, a century ago. Uh, and, and it was outlaws that were uh, making, making the world uh, miserable. Uh, and somehow there has got to be a way to outlaw war. That just it just doesn't make any logical sense. Uh, and it, it 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 is just uh, heartbreaking to me. So somehow or other, uh, if there is a motivation, uh, if there's a priority for the people who are uh, governing uh, the world today, uh, it, it has to be uh, eliminating warfare on increasing the efficiency of how we do things. 
it really is an engineering problem. It's a, uh, among my lesser heartbreaks is uh, why there are so few technologists uh, in, our, in the Congress, in, in our government. So uh, I'm not blaming the government. Uh, I'm blaming the technologists. Maybe they have a, a much too narrow viewpoint uh, and they're too logical to go into politics. Uh, but there has got to be a way to bring science into politics. Uh, we ought to eliminate warfare. We've got to increase efficiency. Uh, we, uh, there is absolutely no reason to have uh, any poverty uh, in the world today. Uh, we uh, do an enormous amount of wasting of both energy uh, and uh, resources uh, today. Uh, and uh, somehow uh, we got to fix that thing. <laughs> Marty, um, thank you very much for your time. I want to thank our audience uh, for tuning in. This website will be available on BPC's YouTube channel, also on our website and on LinkedIn. And we'll be sharing clips of this uh, event of, of Marty's observations over the, the coming days and weeks. Marty, thank you so much for your time and for your uh, observations and insights. Oh, it's my great pleasure. I, I love the opportunity to spot out. And by the way, uh, you want to get uh, uh, YT's uh, mailing address, I'd love to send him a book. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dane, and thanks very much to, to the audience for your patience with me.